Hey everyone, today we're doing a hardware news recap for the last week of computer hardware and some notes on the upcoming Computex trade show, which is the biggest for our industry every year. It is less than, less than a month, it's a couple weeks away at this point. And also recapping some of the stream. But beyond that, rumors on Ryzen because the new one's coming up, so those are going to be nonstop for a while. Intel debuting 7 nanometer process at some point to try and co uh, combat TSMC's 5 nanometer. And then Intel also expecting a rebound in CPU shortages for second half of 2019. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's new audio sound card, engineered by AudioNote. EVGA CEO knows high quality audio and has begun bringing sound cards back. The new audio sound card is capable of delivering hair raising audio superior to onboard sound. The card includes a line in, headphone, line out, and mic in, and a Sony Philips digital interface. New audio also leverages EVGA's PCB design experience, has upgradable op amps, and uses AKM premium components for its DAC and ADC. Learn more at the link in the description below. So for the quick GN store news item, the medium mod mats have actually been shipping out and the large as well since we got them back in. A lot of you have bought the mediums. Thank you for picking those up. Uh, we have a decent amount of stock on medium. We're very low on large at this point, but they are on store.gamersnexus.net if you're interested. The live stream results in Computex, if you missed our about eight hours of live streaming this past weekend. We overclocked a Ryzen 7 2700X with Joe Steponzi, AKA Bearded Hardware, and overclocked a Kingpin EVGA 2080 Ti card. We have recaps on those streams on the channel for more detail, but the very, very short version is that the Ryzen 7 2700X CPU, we got up to about 5.6 gigahertz nearly, and uh, scored pretty high in Cinebench as well. We were approaching, not quite there, but we were approaching low-end Threadripper, like 1950X last-gen results. Uh, so we were something like 500 points away from Threadripper. And then for the cane pin card, the, the uh, 2080 Ti cane pin, we ended up at almost 2600 megahertz. And for point of reference, the base overclocks on most 2080 Ti's will end at about 2050 to maybe 2115 if you're lucky. Uh, so 2600 is quite high. That's, that's why we still have a lot of LN2, because we were using it for those streams. So if you do want to catch the short recaps with more detail on what we did, uh, what types of settings we applied, you can find those on the channel. But that's the short version if you wanted one. So rumor up first. There's actually a, been a lot of these the last few days, and it's all about Ryzen. First, the, the note on rumors. We try not to pay too much attention to rumors uh, or leaks of specs because a lot of the time they're wrong. Uh, we try not to speculate, especially. But if it looks like it's credible, we'll talk about it. One thing that is not really at this point uh, super credible, although maybe possible, is uh, it, it seems like so people are talking a lot about 5 gigahertz and Ryzen 3000. And there's kind of, it's nebulous what that means. 5 gigahertz doesn't, maybe like super XFR on who knows what future chip. But uh, realistically, you're probably almost certainly not going to see 5 gigahertz all core. So get that idea out of your head now. 5 gigahertz all core stock out of the box, almost certainly not happening. Um, I just wanted to address that one right away because that one's, that one's pretty easy to tackle. And a lot of people do seem to be expecting that. So expect smaller gains than that. But beyond that, uh, we can talk about some of the other things here. So, Rumors and speculation running rampant. We know that there's going to be a 16 core and a 12 core. GN talked about that after CES. We were able to confirm it at CES. The release date for those is to be determined. There's going to be an eight core Ryzen 7 SKU. That is known fact. And 12 and 16 core, we know with pretty high certainty for several months now. So those are happening, but that was, a, I guess, leaked a bit again. And uh, TUM API SAK on Twitter is the one who has been claiming that there's a 16 core engineering sample out in the wild and reporting a, uh, an alleged base clock of 3.3 gigahertz and an alleged boost clock of 4.2 gigahertz. So this coincides with a lot of what we've heard. We know there's 16 cores at some point. We've also heard, uh, well, I'm not going to give the frequency numbers we've heard because I don't know if they're fully accurate, but not 5 gigahertz. Uh, we have not heard that yet. So maybe XFR on like a lower end, lower core count chip or something maybe. But anyway, that'll be on X570. We have information on those boards coming up at Computex for sure. The motherboard manufacturers will almost certainly all have X570 there. We'll be reporting on it. So make sure you stay, stay subscribed or get subscribed to see our Computex coverage. We will get there like May 22nd or something. And then the show officially starts 
roughly the 27th. And after AMD's keynote is when you can expect to see a lot of X570 coverage. As for the rest, uh, well, stay tuned, I, I guess. The, the biggest leak that we have right now is potentially 3.3 gigahertz base, 4.2 boost, and uh, uh, to be determined on how many cores that affects, and that's for the 16 core. It's also going to be a 12 core at some point. Anyway, NVIDIA is apparently going to stop dividing Turing into the A and non-A SKUs. This is something we reported on when dissecting the EVJ RTX 2070 XE Ultra. We compared the TU-106400-A1 and the TU-106400-A-A1 dies, and and the tu 106400 a one dies and there was a pretty significant difference between those. The separate Turing dies allowed NVIDIA to cherry pick the best of the best out of their yields and offer them in the form of A dies for partners, flagship, and overclocked cards for an uh, extra cost. Meanwhile, NVIDIA could offer the lower quality non-A dies, which NVIDIA forbade pre-overclocking on, for lower priced cards down the stack. Users could, of course, overclock these cards themselves, but AIB partners were not allowed to pre-overclock them and it's highly unlikely that a non-A die would overclock as well as its binned A die counterpart. According to the Tom's Hardware report, at the end of May, the RTX 2080 and 2070 cards will use only one variant of Turing, and that's going to be the TU-104-410. No more A in there, and TU-106-410, respectively. This implies that TSMC's 12 nanometer FFN process that the GPUs are built onto is mature enough for optimum yield, and NVIDIA no longer needs to separate the silicon out. This is theoretically good news, as the new silicon should level the playing field in terms of price relative to the GPU users are buying. It should also mean that we can expect higher quality Turing silicon in the future, and we'll see if NVIDIA plans to do the same thing with the 2080 Ti and the TU-102 Ti. In Intel news, the company revealed in its 2019 major investor meeting that it had, uh, it was like a four-hour thing on the phone, that it will ship its first 10 nanometer CPUs in volume, finally, Ice Lake this June. And this also aligns with Intel's plans to have Ice Lake-based devices on shelves for a holiday of 2019. Intel also anticipates a steady cadence of 10 nanometer products throughout 2019 and 2020 and then 10 nanometer uh, Agile X FPGAs, a 10 nanometer GPU at some point, Tiger Lake, and 10 nanometer Snow Ridge SOCs aimed at 5G. Intel will also be debuting its 7 nanometer process in 2021, competing with TSMC's 5 nanometer process. Intel's first 7 nanometer product will be an Intel XE graphics architecture based GPU, following its first discrete GPU in 2020. Intel's 7 nanometer process will be the first time the company uses EUV or extreme ultraviolet lithography, and Intel expects a two times improvement in terms of density over 10 nanometer. Intel will also lean heavily into its EMIB and Favros technology at 7 nanometer. Intel finally also plans to focus on intranode optimizations, so this would be more plus steps. We saw a lot of 14 nanometer plus, 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 plus. And despite getting kind of mocked, uh, to Intel's credit, Driving 14 nanometer as far as it has is genuinely impressive. They got a lot out of that process, and it sounds like this will continue going forward. So rather than just being a stopgap for 10 nanometer, this will this will go into perhaps a 10 nanometer plus at some point in the future. And it also helps avoid uh, taking too much risk with new nodes going forward, while also improving the scaling between generations and how much can be gotten out of each uh, step in the process. So Intel expects to deliver one Moore's Law gain at the beginning of a node and then one at the final revision of a node. AMD News Now, the world's current fastest supercomputer is called Summit, and it is set to be dethroned in 2021 with a joint venture between AMD and Cray. Cray, if you don't know, was one of the original, one of the OG high-end or supercomputer manufacturers, and we actually have some coverage of them from years ago when we visited the Mountain View Computer History Museum in California. And uh, we have that coverage on the channel. If you just search for Computer History Museum, look for the one with Jim Vincent joining me. We show the Cray supercomputers and some of the other Cray computers at that time. So Frontier is what the system is supposed to be called. It is expected to be delivered to the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in 2021 and will be the world's first exascale supercomputer targeting 1.5 exaflops of compute performance. This is roughly five times Summit's current uh, 200 petaflops of performance. And the exact details haven't yet been confirmed, but Frontier will be leveraging AMD's Epic CPUs, Radeon Instinct GPUs, and AMD's Infinity Fabric, and 
Cray's Slingshot technology. It's an interconnect. Uh, each node will feature one AMD Epic CPU and then four Radeon Instinct GPUs. So the quote from Steve Scott, Senior Vice President and CTO at Cray is as follows. We are excited to work with the team at AMD to deliver the Frontier system to Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Cray's Shasta supercomputers are designed to support leading edge processor technologies and high performance storage, all tightly interconnected by Cray's new Slingshot network. The combination of Cray and AMD technology in the Frontier system will dramatically enhance performance at scale for AI, analytics, and simulation, enabling DOE to further push the boundaries of scientific discovery. Frontier will be deployed to study weather, subatomic structures, genomics, physics, and more. DigiTimes has been reporting recently that Intel and its supply chain vendors for notebooks are signaling Intel CPU shortage will ease in June of 2019, the first time we've really heard anything of that sort for about a year now. And this is as Intel expects to increase its shipments of entry-level processors. So Intel has been aggressively focusing on the higher margin products. It's also shifted some of its DIY processors to SIs or system integrators instead. The company has been focusing on top customers as well during the CPU drought. And this change, if they do uh, overcome the shortage, will be significant for pricing and for availability. Digitimes reports that Intel has informed notebook partners that it will begin shipping entry-level chips in June. And while there will still be some shortages, the shortages will greatly narrow. Notebook shipments are expected to rebound in the second quarter after a sluggish first quarter, primarily riding on the hype for Intel and NVIDIA's newest mobile chips. Intel's CPU shortage has driven many vendors and OEMs to put in orders with AMD. However, according to Digitimes sources, vendors such as Dell, HP, and Lenovo are expected to be putting in more orders with Intel instead of AMD. Intel CEO Bob Swan recently acknowledged Intel CPU troubles in an earnings call, stating that the CPU shortage would not be fully rectified until quarter three. Swan also vowed, quote, never again to be a constraint in Intel's customers' growth. Last year, Dell EMC CTO John Rose didn't seem to be overly impressed with AMD's Epic platform. And we have a, a quote there saying, AMD is doing some interesting things. And by adding them to the portfolio, we pick up a few extra areas. But let's be very clear. There is a huge dominant player in compute semiconductors. And then there is a challenger, which is doing some very good innovative work called AMD. But the gap between them is quite large in terms of market share and use cases. So our portfolio is not going to change in a meaningful way. And Roche said this in the interview last year and then said, don't expect it to be a duopoly anytime soon. Now, in a very contrasting statement, Dell's Dominique Van Ham states that the company will essentially triple its Epic server offerings and support the upcoming 7 nanometer Epic Rome product. And this has uh, got a quote as well that says, out of, let's say, 50 or so platforms that we have today, Three of them are AMD, and we'll probably triple that by the end of this year, going up to nine in that instance. So aside from the promises that 7 nanometer brings, Van Ham cites a high demand for Epic from customers, particularly in general purpose markets. Still, AMD's representation in Dell's server portfolio will pale in comparison to Intel's. Again, nine out of 50 in that instance, but it is growing. And challenges aside, AMD's Epic adoption uh, continues steadily as the company has been picking its shots wisely with cloud service providers. We talked about that last week with AWS. That's it for this one. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. Make sure you check back for Computex coverage as we ramp into it. But we do have lots of GPU coverage and some reviews coming up this week. You can subscribe for those. Go to store.gamersnexus.net. Support us directly by buying something like one of our mod mats or one of our shirts. This is the GPU artifacting shirt. And patreon.com slash gamersnexus for behind the scenes videos. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.